Welcome back to Parking Full Time. I am Big Dave, the Parks Professor. And I want to specifically welcome you to this Bible study and prayer time. The goal of Parking Full Time is to display the glory of God's creation by exploring America one park at a time. That the God who created this world is the same God who sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross, pay for our sins, and save this world. And that's what these Bible study videos are designed to highlight. Right now we're studying through the Gospel of John. And in the next few videos, we're going to look at John chapters 18 and 19, which describe the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. Um, I always get really emotional when I read and study this text. Uh, one of my sources wrote, uh, in these chapters, man did his worst and God gave his best. I like that. So let's start reading here in verse uh, in chapter 18. Uh, John chapter 18, so it says, uh, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, which, where was a garden, into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither he went there with his disciples. Um, the Gospel of Mark gives us some more information about um, some things that happen here than John does. So I'm not going to turn there, but I'm going to write down a reference here. Um, and the reference I'm going to write down is Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. And again, that gives us some more information about some other things that happen here that John doesn't tell us about. Uh, for example, John doesn't specifically tell us which garden they went into. Uh, it just says they went across the Brook Kedron, where was a garden. But on the east side of the Brook Kedron, on the other side of the Brook Kedron, uh, is the Mount of Olives. And on the side of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. So almost surely the garden that John is talking about here, that's almost surely the Garden of Gethsemane. And likewise, John doesn't tell us everything about, uh, he doesn't tell us everything that happens in Gethsemane. Uh, and Mark does give us uh, some more information. Uh, for example, Mark talks about uh, Jesus praying to the Father, not that I will, but what thou wilt. Uh, that was a very important prayer of Jesus there. Um, he talks about the disciples falling asleep while they were trying to pray. And John doesn't mention that at all. Uh, after all, he was one of the disciples <laughs> uh, who, who was falling asleep. <laughs> uh, so John doesn't give us, uh, he doesn't tell us everything about what happens in the garden here. He actually just goes straight to his uh, arrest and betrayal here. Look down at verse 3. So Judas then, that's Judas Iscariot, the, the pretend disciple that we studied about uh, last time, uh, who had left back in chapter 13 to betray him. Uh, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither, he came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Uh, they came out to the Garden of Gethsemane to take him by force. But notice what happens next. Look at verses 4 and 5. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. And I'll say more about that in a minute here. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them, stood with the, uh, the band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, who had come to the garden with lanterns and torches and weapons to arrest him. I want to call your attention to something that's a little on the detailed and technical side, but it's really important. I'm going to box it a total of three times. It's these two little words here, I am. And I'm not sure if this comes across on camera, but when Jesus answers their question, he asks them, whom seek ye, who are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto them, I am he. In his answer here, this word he is italicized. And again, I'm not sure if that comes across on camera, but it is. When you're reading the King James Version, when you come across a word that is italicized, like the word he is right there, 
What that means is that that word didn't appear in the original Greek text. It means that that word was added by the translators in order to make the English make sense. So the actual words that Jesus answered them when they tell him we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, the actual words he used were, once you translate them to English, I am. That's his actual answer. So, of course, that raises the question, well, why did the translators add the he there? And I'll explain that after we read verse 6. Look at verse 6. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am, and this is a repeat of the first time, but I'll box that again because that turns out to be really important. As soon then as they uh, had said unto him, I am he, or I am, to use directly what he said, as soon as he said that, they went backward and fell to the ground. That response, I am here, when he says, I am here, I am there, and he's going to say it a third time in verse 8. Once we get um, up to verse 8, it's uh, again here. I'll go ahead and box it now. So the same thing, I am, and then the he and italicized. That response, when he says, I am here, that actually has a double meaning. On one hand, he's responding to their statement of who they're seeking. They said they're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. And in his response, he's affirming that, yes, that's me. I'm the one you're seeking. Uh, that's why the, the translators added the word he there. They added that in order to make this conversation and make that response make sense. So on one level, that's what he's doing. But there's another level. And to understand that other level, you need to remember the seven I am sayings in the Gospel of John. And we took quite a bit of time and studied all seven of those earlier in this study. Uh, in John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In uh, chapter 8, he said, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, he said, I am the door of the sheepfold, and I am the good shepherd. In chapter 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And when we studied each of those sayings, I made the point that I am is the name that God gave for himself when he called Moses to lead the, lead the Israel people out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 3. And that name I am, it reminds us that God wasn't created like we are. God is not part of the created order. Nobody created God. Uh, God doesn't rely on anybody or anything else to sustain him like we do. Uh, I have to take food and water. If I don't, I die. God's not that way. He doesn't rely on anybody or anything else to keep him going. I, God didn't have a birthday like we do. He just is. He's the self-sufficient one. His name is I Am. And when Jesus speaks that, when he speaks the name of God, you see their reaction. And again, by speaking the name of God, he's identifying that, yes, he is the creator God. He is the I am. He's the self-sufficient one. Notice their reaction to that down here, uh, down here in verse six. Uh, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, again, he said, I am, he used the name of God. They went backward and fell to the ground. Now, don't think that if you go up and tell someone, I am, that's going to happen. No, this happened because of who Jesus is, because he is the I am. You see, the thing I'm trying to get you to see here, they're getting ready to do some really evil things to him here in chapters 18 and 19. But in spite of all of the bad things, all of the, the worst things, as I, I mentioned at the beginning of this video, that they're getting ready to do to him, He's still in control. God's still in total control of this situation. I've heard people say, my sins killed Jesus, or I killed Jesus. No, you didn't. Nobody killed Jesus. He willingly died. He knew we owed a death payment, and he willingly died to pay that death payment. You see, the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. Our sin separates us from God. We've all done things that we shouldn't have done, done things he's told us not to do, and failed to do things he has told us to do. It also says the penalty for that sin is death. 
The wages of sin is death. But it goes on to say we can have our death penalty paid for by believing in him. We owed a death payment. We're getting ready to see here he, he's going to pay that death payment by dying on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that person who's going to pay that death payment, he says two words. He says, I am, and they went backward and fell to the ground. Now, you'd think maybe at this point that they'd realize that, you know, after this happens, after he says two words and they go back and fall on the ground, uh, maybe you'd think that they'd realize that, you know, trying to arrest this guy, you know, maybe this isn't such a great idea. (laughs) Um, But no, they're soldiers. They do or try to do what they're commanded to do. And all these evil things that they're getting ready to do to him here, they couldn't have done any of those things. Except he allowed it. Except he willingly died so we could have everlasting life by believing in him. And the next time someone tries to guilt trip you, no, you need to remember that. He gave himself willingly. And you see that here. He's in total control of this situation. I had said up here in verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, he knew exactly what they were trying to do to him. He could have stopped it. He had the power to stop it if he wanted to. But he let them do it. He let them do it to pay our death payment. He died willingly. Now, in the next few verses, almost the exact same conversation happens again. Uh, Look up here at verse 7. Uh, Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. And again, that he there is italicized. He answers the same way. He says, I am. And again, double meaning. He's confirming, yes, I'm the one you're seeking. He's also confirming, yes, I am God. He's using the name of God. Then he says something very interesting. He says, If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, Of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. It's really amazing the way Jesus is thinking and what he's doing here. Um, He's only hours away from the cross, and yet he's still showing his concern for his disciples. He says, uh, here in verse 8, he says, If I'm the one you're seeking, let these other people who are with me and the other people who are with him, that would be his disciples. He says, let them go. You're going to arrest me? Okay, arrest me. Let them go. And more or less, they do. They let the disciples go. Let me write down a reference that uh, we studied a few videos ago. Uh, John chapter 13 and verse 1. John chapter 13 and verse 1. Uh, this was at the very beginning of the, um, the Last Supper discourse uh, that we spent several videos studying. And it's referring to Jesus and his disciples. Uh, What John chapter 13, verse 1 says, it says that he loved them to the end. And I unpacked that phrase a few videos ago. Uh, The phrase means he loved them to the uttermost. He loved them as much as anyone could love anyone. And you see that here. He doesn't want them to get arrested and go through the suffering that he's about to go through. At least not yet. He says... Let them go. And basically the soldiers do. The soldiers let them go. Now, next comes the interesting event. Look at verses uh, 10 and 11 down here. Uh, verse 10, it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. Uh, Simon, Simon Peter, Peter's going to do a lot of things here in this text today. But here's the first thing he does. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Now, the Greek word that's translated sword here, uh, in verse 10 and again here in verse 11, uh, that word it implies a short sword. So probably the sword that Peter drew here, it was probably more like a dagger. And when you attack someone with a dagger, generally um, you're not aiming for the ear. For the right ear, which is what Peter cut off here. Uh, So Peter's actions here, they were as ineffective as they were ill-advised. 
Now, there's another little detail that John doesn't report, but again, one of the other gospel writers, in this case, Luke does. And so I'm going to write down another reference here that I'm not going to turn to. I'm going to write down Luke chapter 22, verse 51. Luke chapter 22 and verse 51. And in Luke's gospel, it records that after Peter had attacked the servant, uh, attacked Malchus here, um, and cut off his right ear, it records, it, Luke tells us that Jesus touched Malchus' ear and healed him. He repaired the damage that Peter had ill-advisedly and ineffectively done. See, the thing I'm trying to get you to see, yet Jesus loved his disciples. He loved his disciples to the uttermost. He loved his disciples to the end. But the, Jesus didn't just care for his disciples. He cared for everyone, including these guys here who were here trying to arrest him and trying to kill him. He cared for everyone, and he shows it in what he does with Malchus. Now we get into the trial itself. Look down at verses 12 and 13. Uh, then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Again, they wouldn't have been able to do that except he allowed it. Okay? He's, Jesus is in total control of the situation. Uh, they, they did that and led him away to Annas the first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now, as a little bit of historical and cultural background here, we see two people mentioned, um, two of the Jewish leaders mentioned uh, here. We have Annas and we have Caiaphas. Um, Annas was the Jewish high priest who had been deposed about 18 years earlier by the Romans. Caiaphas was the man who officially held the office of high priest at that time. That's why you see both of them here. But again, you have to remember, again, a little cultural and historical background. Uh, the Jews hated the Romans for coming in and deposing Annas and for coming in and taking over. And so many of the Jews, they still regarded Annas as the high priest, as the real high priest, even though officially the one who officially held that title at this time was Caiaphas. Um, also, it was the case that Annas had several sons and son-in-laws, including uh, Caiaphas, it tells us here, uh, it tells us Annas was father-in-law to Caiaphas. Um, he had several sons and son-in-laws who, who served as official high priest. And so even though Annas is no longer the official high priest, he still has a lot of power. When you see Annas and Caiaphas, uh, you see them together a lot, and that's the situation there. Now look at verse 14. So verse 14, uh, John reminds us of something here. It says, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Let me remind you of what John is talking about here. And I'll write down another reference that we studied um, a few videos ago. John chapter 11 and verse 50. John chapter 11 and verse 50. Um, we're looking at a lot of references we've studied before because this is the part of the text where everything really starts to come together and come to a head here. Right? John chapter 11, verse 50. Let's remind us of the, let me remind you of the situation um, that John is talking about here in verse 14 that he's talking about regarding Caiaphas. So let's flip back to John chapter 11. You don't have to go very far back. And John chapter 11 here. Um, so the uh, the Jewish leaders are gathering together, they're meeting, they're plotting to kill Jesus. And here's what he says about them here. So this is John chapter 11, look at verse 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, and again, he was the official high priest, um, with Anaphas pulling some of his strings behind, Annas pulling some of his strings behind him here. So Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, you know nothing at all. You have no idea. He tells the rest of the Jewish leaders, you don't, you don't understand what you're talking about. He completely disagrees with what they want to do. So he says, you know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. When we studied this video, when we studied this passage a few videos ago, I circled the word uh, the word us there, and I, I highlighted the fact that Caiaphas and these Jewish leaders were really only concerned about themselves, their money, and their power. He's concerned about us. That's what they're first and foremost concerned about. 
When you look at the things that they do to Jesus in chapters 18 and 19, the text we're studying right now, a lot of the things they did to him were illegal. Okay? They were contrary to Jewish and or Roman law. And I'll highlight some of those things um, as we get back into the text in John chapter 18 here. But the fact that the things they did were illegal, that's not really the main point. And it's not the main point that John tries to, to get us to see here. The illegality is not the main point. The main point is that the trial that we read about is not a real trial designed to discover truth and determine fact. It's a show trial. It's designed to give these Jewish leaders, including Caiaphas and Annas, a reason to execute Jesus, which is what they've been trying to do for several chapters now. Uh, Caiaphas said way back here in chapter 11 that one man should die for the people, talking about Jesus. He wanted to kill him. He wanted to get rid of Jesus so that they could protect their money and their power. They wanted to get rid of Jesus because it was expedient for us, as he says here in chapter 11. And the whole point of this trial is to give them a reason to do that, a reason to execute Jesus. Jesus. And John reminds us of that in chapter 18, and that's the main thing you have to remember when you're the main thing John wants us to realize when you're studying this trial. Now, back in chapter 18, for the rest of our text today, we go back and forth between what's going on with the trial and what's going on with Peter. And what comes up next, so Peter had just tried to uh, just tried to cut off the uh, he just tried to attack one of the servants of the high priest, Malchus here, and succeeded only in cutting off his ear, which Jesus then repaired. But next comes kind of the low point of Peter's ministry in the Gospels here. So keep reading here. Um, we left off at verse 14. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, we go back to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Uh, but Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, uh, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Um, John doesn't specifically tell us who this other disciple that's mentioned here. Um, he's mentioned twice. Um, he's mentioned once up here in verse 15, and so did another disciple. This other disciple is mentioned here also in verse 16, then went out that other disciple. Uh, John doesn't directly tell us who that other disciple is. Traditionally, most people think it's John, the writer of this gospel. Uh, I agree with that, but that's too technical to get into uh, on this video. Um, but now Peter starts, now comes the low point of Peter's ministry. Look at verse 17. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou not also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. We've got to underline that phrase here. I am not. That's a straight denial. It's also a lie. Uh, Peter was one of Jesus' first disciples. But he lies to her, this insignificant, um, literally slave girl who's keeping the door he lies to her. He says, no, I am not. He says, he's not a disciple, period. Keep reading in verse 18. And the servants and officers stood there, uh, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now, if it's cold, warming yourself by the fire would have been the natural thing to do. Uh, if you're out camping on a cold night, you want to build a fire and warm yourself. So it's a natural thing to do, but I, the main thing I want you to notice here, I want you to notice who he's with. And Peter stood with them. Who's them? Well, it's the servants and the officers. It's literally the, the servants and the officers of the high priest. Literally, it's the people that we just saw in action a few minutes ago. Back here in uh, back here in verse three, these are when Judas shows up. He, he receives a he was having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. 
these are the people that Peter's with. It's these same people who are who had just showed up a few minutes ago and arrested Jesus. You see, the application I'm trying to get you to see here, Peter's trying to blend in with the wrong crowd. He's trying to blend in with them, trying not to make a, um, not to make a show of himself standing off by himself. He tries to blend in with these servants and officers, the people who were working for the high priest, the people who were trying to kill Jesus. And it doesn't work for Peter. Peter gets called out first by the damsel and then twice other times here later in this text. Trying to blend in with these guys, it didn't work for Peter. And it's not going to work for you either. If you believe in Jesus and you try to blend in with unbelievers, it won't work for your benefit. You're going to lose the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, as Peter does here. So that's what Peter's doing. Now, again, we're going, we go back and forth between Peter and the trial. So now we go back to the trial. Look at verse 19 here. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. And Jesus answered them, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Uh, he hadn't tried to keep uh, secret anything that uh, any of his public teachings. Why askest thou me? Uh, ask them which heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. You see, if Jesus had really committed blasphemy or the cry, any of the crimes that he's accused of, if he had really committed a crime worthy of death, they wouldn't have any trouble finding witnesses. Thousands of people had heard what Jesus had said. But you don't see any of those thousands of people here. You see the Jewish leaders, their minions, and Jesus. That's who you see. Then look at verse 22 here. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus. He was close enough to him, he could reach out and literally smack him. Okay? Uh, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Uh, they slapped him with an open hand. Now, it wasn't legal for them to do that at this point in the proceedings, but again, that's not really what's important. What's important is this wasn't a real trial. This was a show trial. Okay. Jesus answers again, verse 23. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now, Anaphas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. And the trial is going to continue here, but for the last thing we're going to look at today, we shift back to Peter. Look at verse 25 here. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Uh, they said therefore unto him, uh, Art thou not also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. Second time he said that here. We'll underline that again. I am not. That's another straight denial. And it's another lie. Again, this is one of Peter's darkest moments, but he learns a lot from this moment, as we're going to see in a few chapters. Then verse 26 here. Uh, one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Well, yeah, you did see him. In fact, he cut off one of your relative's ears <laughs> before Jesus miraculously healed it. But, of course, Peter denies again. Verse 27, then Peter denied again. Underline the word denied here a third time. Then Peter denied again, and immediately the cock crew. A couple of other things I want to mention here. Um, uh, and a couple of references I'm going to write down but not turn to. Uh, one of them is uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 71. I'll write that here. Mark chapter 14, verse 71. Again, Mark gives us a little more information than John does. Uh, John just says, then Peter denied again. Uh, Mark tells us that he did more than just say, I am not, more than just a, a straight, simple denier. Uh, denial. Uh, Mark says that he began to curse and swear. Uh, Mark says that he began saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. That is, he said, I am not, with emphasis, with conviction. But notice the last thing here. So Peter denied again. He denied for a third time. 
and immediately the cock crew. Immediately the rooster crowed. And this time, this brings back to something that we studied a few weeks ago. And the last reference I'm going to write down here, John chapter 13, verse 38. John chapter 13, verse 38. And that was five chapters ago. But Jesus had predicted that exactly this was going to happen five chapters ago. He predicted, he told, the, he told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And notice here, then Peter denied again, denied for the third time, and immediately the rooster crowed. That rooster crowed at exactly the right time. You see, even though Jesus is bound here and he's getting slapped and he's on trial, he's still in control. They couldn't have done anything to him except he allowed it. As a final thought on this text here, uh, we've seen Jesus said three times, I am. He correctly said who he was. Once in verse 5, he said, I am. That's quoted in verse 6, where it says, I am. And then again in verse 8, he says, I am. Three times, Jesus says, I am. Likewise, three times, Peter says, I am not. Once here in verse 17, I am not. Again, down here in verse 25, I am not. And a third time, and John doesn't use the words, I am not, but he actually said more than just, I am not. He said that with some emphasis here in verse 27. Three times Jesus says, I am. Three times Peter incorrectly, he lies, he says, I am not. And so my question is this final, as my final thought on this text here, which is it for you? Are you an I am or are you an I am not? Are you an I am? Do you believe that he is the son of God and God the son? Do you believe that he paid the death payment for your sins? Or do you reject him? Do you deny who he really is? Are you an I am not? I hope you're an I am. And if you have believed in him, I hope you're an I am with what you do. Are you with the things that you do with how you're following him? Are you an I am or an I am not? I'm trying to be an I am. I don't get it right all the time, but I try to follow him. I'm trying to be an I am. I hope you're trying to be an I am too. We'll look at the rest of John chapter 18 next time. I'll close this video the way I close all of my videos, and that's with a quick look at my prayer list here. Uh, some things I'm praying for, I'm praying for our country and its leaders. I'm praying that more people will believe in him, that more people will choose to be I am's and recognize him for who he is. I'm praying that for power and protection for preachers of the gospel, for people who are trying to persuade men and trying to persuade people to be I am's. I'm praying that new believers will grow. I'm pray praying that believers will care for each other as Jesus has cared for us. So I'm going to take a few minutes and pray for these things. I hope that you will too. Until next time, I am Big Dave, the Parks Professor for Parking Full Time. Have a great afternoon. Take care. And Lord bless.